so so the coercion of forcing i mean it's kind of like the obamacare thing with forcing people to buy the medical insurance because it's a so-called individual mandate so it's like oh we're going to force you to buy a product see that's the thing obamacare is a, the individual mandate is actually very similar to eminent domain in a manner of speaking so the one is where they force you to buy something and the other one they force you to sell something but buying and selling or trading is yeah. voluntary so how the hell does that work in bizarro land of the state? Well, it doesn't. Therefore, the world is in conflict. Well, no kidding. Under Attack Radio, your home for libertarianism in action. We provide you with real free market solutions using the freedom umbrella of direct action to give you the tools necessary to increase your own personal liberty. As Ludwig von Mises said, liberty is always freedom from the government. And now your host, Shane. All right, and welcome to the Vanu Podcast, uh, the Bob podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. Uh, so tonight, Kyle and I are recording a, a Patreon exclusive for uh, for for Vani, for the uh, Vani Patreon page. But this episode will segue so nicely with uh, the episode we did on Liberty Under Attack Radio, uh, where we had yeah, had Kyle on again. You know, he's our creative consultant over there, and uh, we we went over you know fee simple versus low deal title on uh, all of the things that uh, happened there, and even kind of uh, you know brought up Rayo in that. So uh, this very well might be used for those purposes as well. Uh, but uh, you know, just uh, just have to see. But but for for right now, you know, this is uh, a Patreon exclusive for Vani. So uh, so yeah, we're we're, we're going to get into an article by uh, by Rayo called "Ethical Land Use." This is found in Vani Life, March 1973. So uh, so Kyle, uh, welcome as always. Um, and uh, you know, as always, you know, uh, as since governments are the primary coercers upon individuals. Uh, the Vani podcast is covered by Bipcot No Government License. This allows reuse and uh, reuse and uh, this allows reuse and modification to anyone except for government governments and the agents thereof. You can learn more at Bipcot.org. And I did just do that off the top of my head, which is why there is a little stutter there. But Kyle, welcome back as always. Um, but uh, <laughs> there was uh, one portion. I don't remember which uh, which article. If you, if you do, please you know step in and, and let me know uh, what article. Oh, it was on uh, uh, it was the uh, private property. Uh, on on private uh, private property ownership or whatever that article from the Vanu book, yeah, uh, where he uh, kind of mentioned uh, you know he he kind of went through the entire article private in quotation marks and he kind of explained very very nicely, uh, you know quite succinctly why uh, you know, uh, <laughs> or at least his feelings on private property and how it uh, isn't really private it really isn't private and then we did that episode on on Liberty Under Attack Radio uh, where we went into uh, all of the gory details. Uh, about uh, you know why uh, you know why Rayo was actually kind of correct here. So uh, we kind of covered the the fee simple aspect, which is uh, definitely not good. Where uh, where basically the state uh, uh, you know lets you live somewhere as long as they allow you to, and uh, you know they can uh, you know take your your property uh, due to uh, you know back taxes for a shopping mall. Uh, or because you don't have a septic tank or, or whatever it is. So uh, the fee simple aspect is very important, but Rayo didn't talk about that. Uh, he didn't. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, we, we, kind of, we, we kind of figured out, Kyle, that, you know, uh, or we kind of speculated that, uh, you know, he was familiar with, with, with some of these things. Yeah, and, and from what relatively little was mentioned in, in the article or chapter in, in the Vanu book, I kind of at least in some sense intuitively understood that perhaps Rayo and I understood more all of that um, background material that, of that of course, uh, I went into at considerable length and on that Ellieway radio episode because not a lot of people know about that, all that background material, historical, financial, and, and also legal too, such as, uh, you know, how the uh, how monarchy actually in many ways uh, led to the development of, of, of fee simple, which was, which of course was then adapted to our democratic republics, and uh, which are and, hypothetically and we all, limited. And we all, all be, we all became uh, what would we all become? We all became. Uh, oh, uh, I'm not going to remember the the right uh, monarchical term. Um, uh, oh shit! 
subjects, citizens. Well, Both? no, no, it was uh, so so only only some sort of uh, class was allowed to uh, own property. Oh, oh yeah, the simple. patrician, yeah, patrician it was, class, it was, yeah. Yeah, it was the patricians, everyone else is the plebeians, but of course now that we're all considered aristocrats by our uh, so-called enlightened uh, democratic republics and so forth, now we're all kind of aristocrats in a manner of speaking in terms of the and land we ownership. we all own the public property, yay! But we oh, actually, that... But we, so, so we all own, we all own the, the so-called public property, but uh, nope, don't own your own private property apparently, but uh, you know, it's controlled schizophrenia there as far as... Uh, you know, what people's perceptions on these things are. And then that's not even getting into uh, all of the issues that come with, uh, with you know, kind of the fee simple, which, I mean, obviously something that's been going around in libertarian circles for a while is the borders and, and how, uh, uh, how you know, the most libertarian position is apparently closed borders uh, somehow with flawed logic to get there. Uh, but, you know, that, that creates, because we're all victimized by the state and therefore, you know, the public property, uh, I mean, we, we are, you know, um, we as victims of the state are, uh, uh, you know, owed, you know, restitution in the form of that uh, public property and to different degrees and with a lot of details. Wow. And really make a whole lot of sense. So that doesn't really make a, make a whole lot of sense with the whole uh, uh, fee simple thing. But, uh, you know, a, whole, a lot of the stuff coming from, you know, those uh, those folks who, uh, you know, like to, uh, you know, do those intellectual masturbation things with not having any, you know, base in reality, in, in, in my opinion. Uh, and, then, and then also, too. They have no influence over it whatsoever. So, uh, right. I mean, a lot of it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. And when you kind of just, you know, toss that on top of it, uh, it uh, just becomes uh, even more of a uh, kerfuffle. Uh, so yes. it's, it's not fun. No, and and some and and any any so-called um, propertarian who wants to abolish the state, arguing in favor of closed borders. Uh, in the in the way that they are under under some misguided notion of restitution. I mean, even the constitutionalists, the minarchists, won't stoop that low. They're at least a tiny bit more honest in the sense of, yeah, we're promoting mercantilism, so what of it? Close the damn border already. You know, they're at least there's no illusions. Like they are. Keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, minarchists are nationalists. They have to be. So that's kind of rather important. So, yeah, of course. Uh, so, yeah, it, you know, in some ways, rather than uh, the alleged differences between the limited government and no government positions are, of course, has been covered on previous episodes of TVP, uh, their similarities, which are all too uh, uncomfortable, at least for me. So, you know, at this point for me, it's about invulnerability to coercion. And if people aren't serious about that, then, like, I don't know what else to say. Um, and if they want to participate in these rhetorical games of uh, one-upsmanship or, uh, or like donate to my website because I, I came up with something that, you know, some sort of explanation that falls softly on people's ears, then, then there's ulterior motives. And then I would even say disingenuous activists, which of course I've written about before. Uh, but if we're talking about the truth, about what actually happened so that people can have an understanding of where things have been and where they are now so that then they can choose what forms of direct action they want to participate in that best coincides with their conscience then yeah we can we can actually do that like what the alternative media is supposed to do is look at the truth of the matter of things and <laughs> such oh how have we digressed from that <laughs> yeah and oh. and so it's so and so regarding like the land use thing i think it's important to look at, at the truth of the matter so yeah so in some ways i guess you could say this is perhaps the spiritual successor to that lua episode on on the fee simple and lodial title thing uh and what's kind of important here was i kind of suspected rayo kind of had a, a similar or virtually identical understanding uh, about how I do too, about the allegedly uh, private lands, land holding in fee simple and all that. And uh, as we'll go through this uh, article and this episode, I, I think I might have been right just a wee bit. <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 I think I think you were. I, I think you were and I think you are. Uh, but I guess one, one final note there is with someone this past weekend, and uh, I mean, he said this to me many times before, but, uh, you know, uh, so it's uh, culture, language and borders uh, make a nation. And uh, unfortunately, with the deter I guess, I guess, depending upon your, your depending upon your perception, not you specifically, Kyle, but the listener, uh, depending upon your perception, uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it's 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 interesting to see kind of the libertarian anarchist community devolve in the way that it is. 
uh, and uh, with with these uh, border Tarians, as they're now called, uh, you know, derisively, uh, they're overlapping a lot more with the nationalists, with uh, kind of these uh, these minarchists, uh, which is it, it's it's really no surprise considering there are plenty of anarchists and, and plenty of minarchists that uh, you know abandon whatever principles and and whatever uh, you know direct action they were doing to go uh, you know uh, um, you know uh, suck Trump's dick. Um, Political I mean, they're, crusading. They're, 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 it's, 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 they're, they're very similar. I mean, the whole race thing is now in the libertarian circles, and, and, and instead of focusing on, you know, actually, uh, you know, bringing about personal freedom, uh, you know, although it really hasn't, it, even, you know, a couple of years ago, Cal, before this even really came about, uh, this whole Trump phenomenon and, and uh, the so-called uh, alt-right and, and, and those sorts of things. You know, there wasn't really a lot of focus on solutions regardless, so I guess I really can't be surprised. It's just whatever, whatever's in the news cycle, whatever's happening, uh, people yeah. tend to, you know, just uh, pony up with that because, uh, you know, uh, uh, even though they're anarchists, I mean, they still, uh, you know— Yeah, they, but it's they, a game to them. They still need a leader, or they uh, just aren't really serious about personal freedom, and, you know, right. uh, they, they, they care more about, uh, you know, well, radical label and, and or whatever, whatever the reasoning is. But uh, uh, they're not serious. And uh, right. as, as far as I'm concerned with uh, whether it's direct action or Vanu, uh, and well, I guess Vanu is direct action, but uh, regardless. Subset, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, they, they aren't serious. They will and, not. Yeah, they are not, no, they're not serious. Well, well, just, yeah, I mean, by their actions, ye shall know them, to borrow a phrase from the Bible. And I think in a very secular sense, I, I think that's kind of obvious too, isn't it? It's like, okay, so what have you done this week? Or month, or even year, and I think by their actions, ye shall know them. So, if you have people who spend a long and inordinate amounts of time and effort, basically arguing in favor of statism, really, and it's not just the border thing, um, then it's kind of like, okay, I guess they've made a decision, haven't they, about what uh, about what they're really supporting and whom they decide to support and so forth, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so the, the border tearing thing does kind of overlap with this because it, it brings up a new problem. If everything is fee simple, then is, uh, well, I guess the, is, is is public. Well, actually, yep. Yeah, so the public property, so called, uh, would be under fee simple. It would just be depending upon uh, what government it is, whether it's the feds or is you know the uh, right uh, the Malheur Wildlife Refuge uh, occupiers would like it. Uh, rather, they'd rather it be you know Oregon or Washington or whatever it is. Uh, so the allodial to, or the uh, fee simple thing is kind of is is relevant here to – uh, to that. So, uh, I mean, uh, if you want to go ahead and get into this and see what Rayo had to say about, uh, you know, uh, more what, what more of what, what Rayo had to say about uh, about uh, land ownership. Yes, please. Let's get to his article, Ethical Land Use. Okay, and uh, this will be released. Uh, you know, this this will be released on Patreon in time. I can actually, and, and you know, not to waste any more time here, but Kyle, one thing that uh, I told you in pre-show was, uh, well, actually not pre-show to this episode, but pre-show to the episode we just recorded. So that's unfortunate. I can't, you know, do like we we record these ahead of time. So when something happens, you know, I just can't. The, the listeners will hear it a month ahead of time. But I, I can actually, you know, uh, say this now. <laughs> but uh, Vonnie Life 1973, the uh, publication that's, that's transcribed, and uh, you'll be able to pick up a copy of it, uh, you know, very, very soon. Just got to go through the proofreading process. Uh, and this is an article from that publication. Uh, and uh, I've got it in a separate Word document. I'll probably just go ahead and post it on the uh, Vonnie Podcast website uh, after we get off here. But uh, let's, let's get into it. So, quote, as a Vonnieist, my policy is non-coercion, live and let live. So long as another human, human does not do or threaten violence, I do, do not intentionally interfere with that person or with artifacts he creates or requires with the consent of the one who creates, end quote. So that kind of lays out his philosophy. And I mean, on the front page of the Vanu Life publication, how to live and let live out of sight and mind of those unwilling to let live. So, it, you know, it overlaps that very, very nicely. So before we even get into this, Kyle, it's really important to point out Obviously, socialists and some socialists and some communists will, you know, say that, you know, private property is a creation of the state uh, and some of those other ridiculous arguments that really don't have any basis in reality. Uh, well, it's, it's very good to, to get this out of the way immediately. When when Rayo was, has some concerns or some issues with, you know, so-called private property, it's not from that perspective. This is this is the probably one or two times in your lifetime that uh, you'll hear an argument uh, not against private property, but some issues with it when it's not coming from that perspective. Uh, Rayo wasn't like that. He was not like that. So we, we, we immediately we kind of get his perception, uh, his his view on, uh, you know, um, on his life. Yep. So uh, let's get to it. All right. Uh, so skipping, for, we're not going to read the entire thing. Um, there's some important parts that uh, we need to read. 
Uh, so let's get to it. Quote, one doctrine holds that land belongs to the first person who uses it or discovers it and claims it. Some people assert that this is the only truly moral doctrine, i.e. consistent with non-coercion. But actually, it is arbitrary. How does a person who first gathers wild berries in a particular valley gain a right to exclude or collect rent from others who wish to gather berries or plant turnips? E can claim the particular berries E gathered, but er action does not create more berries, nor trees, nor soil. Likewise, someone who grows a crop may claim the harvest as well as improvements to the land, such as clearing and terracing, so long as these improvements endure, but does not thereby gain any right to interfere with others who make non-conflicting uses." End quote. So, I don't know if you noticed this, Kyle, uh, but there's something... <laughs> So, so Rayo and other Venuans, they went with uh, maybe I don't know if this was a purpose, but they used gender-neutral, you know, terms E and ER, like that was their thing throughout the entire publication. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so I guess that's what's one thing. I don't know if that was I, I don't know why that was, but uh, so that's that, that's I guess that's that that first portion. What are your thoughts? I think it's I think it's kind of important to keep in mind that of the time period. Right. So this is the countercultural 60s, as we've mentioned in episode after episode after episode, you know, like like we're, we've gone now through like a season and a half of these on the normal TVP lineup. Right. And I can't emphasize that enough. The cultural and time period context of when Rhea was kind of saying this stuff. So while it would probably be at least a little bit correct by if there were any critics of Rayos, probably by some of those Bordertarians and some uh, really the alt-right saying that, oh, Rayo was just a dirty hippie. Um, it's kind of like, yeah, and was, so he was, what? He was a hippie, wasn't it? Well, he might have been, you know, yeah, get physically dirty, maybe. I mean, yeah, he was out there in a polyethylene A tent, but mm -hmm. um, so so yeah, maybe I was maybe I you know jump the gun there. I've read this article. This is my third time. So, uh, but yeah, he is actually <laughs> making an like an, a, a, an argument against. Uh, the I guess the the first Caesar doctrine, you know, mixing in labor with the land, because I, I guess uh, you know picking berries on something or making an improvement upon it uh, would be mixing labor with the land. But uh, Ray mm -hmm. calls that arbitrary. Which Kyle, I, I will be honest, that you know that that is uncomfortable. It really it, is. Yes, yeah, it is uncomfortable. And obviously, I mean, in a lot of ways, this kind of all goes back to John Locke's second treatise of government, right? Mixing your labor with the land and all that. So that's kind of something to keep in mind. So as we go through this article. Folks, do keep in mind, this is from a propertarian perspective, but probably more importantly in some ways, also keep in mind, Rayo, I think, whether implicitly or explicitly, is also kind of pointing out lawfare too, at least in terms of a legalized land ownership being a way of like suckering people like a con, like a con game, like, oh, you own the land, but not really, right? So in other words... uh Think of it this way. In a lot of ways, it's kind of like the entire notion of what the lawyers would call um, property acquisition and titling. So like according to the state's own legal system, who owns the land? And of course, lawyers like to lie a lot, or at least many of them do. And so when it comes to land ownership, it's like, uh, yeah, how did that work again? And so I think all Rayo is doing really here is criticizing the lawyers regarding how they conceive of a prop of what they themselves would call property acquisition and titling. And all Rayo is saying is that they're just full of it. Now he's not using the term lawfare like I am. He's not explicitly pointing out the lawyers, but he's kind of showing how their so-called reasoning is not reasoning. I well, think there's yeah, a let me yeah, let me let me come back at you like I mean just, just as I kind of said I, I, I he's he's making a, a direct or like a direct you know counter argument to the Lockean notion and obviously there were lawyers then that's the, I'm not denying mm -hmm. that but uh, he he kind of is coming at it and saying you know the the first user principle is is arbitrary and that uh, you know how can someone who just comes and pick, picks berries or you know builds a shack somewhere tell like you know tell people that they can't you know. Uh, pick, pick, pick berries there, set up a shack too. Uh, so he is making an argument directly against the first user principle, which again, like I said, it makes me uncomfortable. Um, but well, see, regarding, yeah, hold on, hold on. As, sorry to interrupt, but as as okay, as a more purely philosophical issue, then, which I think is what maybe the issue here is, is not so much a legal one. <sighs> Remember, John Locke was not very specific regarding what counts as shall we say, homesteading. All Rayo here is saying, 
okay, well, we know from first user, first uh, owner or whatever that there it has to be there, but what's the what's the threshold? What is the wait for it specific threshold of what counts as being the first user, first owner? Right. Okay. That's, yeah, that's, that's all he's doing. That's all he's doing here as far as at least at this point. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So let's let's go ahead and move forward here. Quote, this doctrine is not only arbitrary in theory, but capricious, uh, if not unworkable in practice. Very little, if any, land in the world today is used with the consent of first users. Typically, okay. a tract of forest is owned in a lumber comp uh, by a lumber company, which bought it from a government 50 years ago, which seized it from an Indian tribe 150 years ago, which seized it from another tribe 500 years ago, which seized it from still another tribe 2,000 years ago. Further investigations may show that the land was held by still another tribe 10,000 years ago, and so forth. Under first user doctrine, most of North America would belong not to the Indians, but to just a few Indians. There is a, ar there's archaeological evidence of at least five different waves of immigrants across the Bering Strait, thousands of years apart. In all probability, descendants of the first group multiplied and used most of the continent. Subsequent, co subsequent comers were tre or trespassers, uh, end quote. So we get further clarification here. So maybe my worry was a little, uh, you know, uh, 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 I guess uh, a little imma or, uh, premature, premature. Uh, you know, he, he makes, uh, uh, you know, a, I think a, a pretty valid point there, right? If, if we're going to go, you know, uh, purely off of the first user, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> no one alive today was the first user of any land in America, right? In so-called America. Uh, so I, I, think, I, I, think he's, he, I think he's making a good point here. Um, and, and maybe that kind of alleviates some of the concerns I had before, some of them at least, but uh, philosophically he was making an argument against the first user principle, and now he's providing some evidence, uh, you know, saying, well, this is kind of arbitrary, right? Because, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the land we have in Southern Illinois, uh, we weren't the first users of that. You know, I'm sure some, you know, Indian tribe out there, you know, thousands of years ago used it, and maybe it was, uh, you know, uh, acquired unjustly. Um, I don't know. What, what do you think, man? Maybe this is maybe this is a particular point I, I disagree with Rayo. So let's let's just take this a step at a time, okay? So I think there's at least two different things going on here. Let's let's kind of do one at a time. I think he's correct in pointing out that like when he mentions about the tract of forest being owned by the lumber company and then so forth, and then he's kind of like tracing it back at least at least one particular path, if you will. Really, all that kind of shows is that none of those different parties respected the property rights of the person before them. And so, therefore, when they get plundered by the next per by the next entity down the line, they can't really complain about losing it because they stole it from right. somebody else. Yeah, so we're not talking. Yeah. They each one of those are dialog. Even the Indians are being being dialogically stopped. Again, let, let's look at that one more time. The lumber company, which bought it from a government 50 years ago, seized it. The government, which seized it from the Indian tribe 150 years ago. That Indian tribe sees it from another Indian tribe 500 years ago, who in turn sees it for another Indian tribe 2,000 years ago, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay, these aren't purchases of land. These are not trades. These are not consensual. They are not voluntary. This is conquering people through uh, blood and violence. And that okay. was, and, and that was, and just to step in real quick, you know, from the, I guess, from the first discovery, the so-called, like the discovery of this, this continent known as America. Um, that there what there had to have been a first user. It's, it's just like if you if you kind of trace back the origins of money, there had to have been a first user. Yeah. Um, which I mean, that's impossible to track that person down now, obviously. Mm -hmm. But every single you know, uh, every single I guess uh, change in uh, so in you know unjust ownership, right? Because uh, yeah. it was acquired by force, it wasn't done contractually. Mm -hmm. uh, every single one after that would have been unjust. Um, mm -hmm. Yep. So and then it just further and yeah. it just further and it further reinforces the coercion of every coercive transfer. Think of it like a, a, a wealth redistribution. That's exactly what he's describing here. It's wealth redistribution by by coercion. That's all it is. So may, so maybe he is correct in saying that it's um, you know it, it, it you know it is unwork like you know the first user principle is unworkable because. Yeah, I mean, you can't you can't trace back to the first user of land or you know their descendants. I mean, that's a, that's just impossible. So, I mean, as, as, you know, philosophically, like this this may like do do you think the let me ask you a question here? Yeah. So. Yeah, sure. So, do you think the, the like the first user like in line with you know propertarian anarchist you know ethics or libertarian yeah, ethics? Yeah. yeah. Um, philosophically, it's sound. It make it makes complete sense. But in reality, do you think any sort any such of uh, you know justly acquired property could like do you do you think that's it's it's actually uh, I guess a, a realistic you know thing. Do you think it's practical? You, 
yeah, you're asking a question about a priori versus a pri uh, a posteriori, right? So, a priori, yes, it works out. That's praxeological. That's that. I mean, that that that's argumentation ethics, right? That that's not in question. Your question is more about a posteriori, right? Your question is more about empirically, does it work out in the real world, right? Correct. Yeah. I think that's what Rayo is criticizing here, and I will at least halfway agree with him on this one, because when you introduce coercion into the mix, it muddies the water, and not only that, but also the span of time. We're talking hundreds of years at least. So tracing it way back, especially with humans, uh, different batches of which did not ex exactly keep written records— how could you prove it in a court of law or in any other context? How could you prove it even even scientifically or or, or, fa or factually or in any other context? How could you do it? Ex you know, exactly. Old... And let me let me step in real quick. So even with the um, the so-called borderitarian argument about how um, you They're know public, the public the public lands thing, uh, you know, uh, since we are all victims of of the gov of, of you know like the United States government, uh, you know that's that's restitution for the, for, for for being victimized. Well, that's still not justly acquired property, right? Well, yeah, but but it's also a stupid argument on its own points because uh, what's his face, who I don't want to give free advertising to, uh, didn't even say who was victimized by the state. I mean, he he was just being completely arbitrary. That that was a clear cut case. He was just he was making up shit as he was going along. I mean, it was really badly argued. It wasn't even argued. He was just making stuff up. I mean, to be perfectly honest, he sounded like Donald Trump. It was that bad. Um, but for some reason, everybody was taking him seriously like he was making a real argument instead of my argument, which is more about protecting the ranchers along uh, the Rio Grande. But of course, you know, to hell with them. Nobody cares about them, even though they actually do own the land in fee simple anyway. But that's but that's kind of its own topic for another time, isn't it? But regarding the more general like this article by Ray on ethical land use. Yeah, I mean, think about it this way. What is the cutoff point? At what point do you just have to kind of call it and say, look, there's been so much coercion plus the span of time being as long as it is, plus the fact that there's no written records or any form of objective evidence regarding property acquisition and land titling, even from a legal perspective, You, where's the cutoff? Do you cut it off at – you know, when actually that first part in, the, in that example he was kind of using where he said attractive forces owned by a lumber company, which bought it from a government 50 years ago. Yeah, which bought it from a government 50 years ago. They didn't seize it from the government. The government sold it to the lumber company. So that's kind of an interesting kawinky dink. Is that voluntary at that point? Interesting question. Yeah, and even too. You, you, you see how oh, muddled – do you see how muddled it gets so quickly? So – in terms of like empirically trying to make this work, I think in the next paragraph when when Rayo is mentioning about well it would belong to at most a few Indians, yeah, no kidding. Because some of those and by the way, they're not tribe. I know what I know what Rayo meant. He's using the vernacular. They they were not tribes, they were nations because each of them were actually they actually were they actually were monarchies, most of them, including the Iroquois and the Algonquin. And uh, even some of the people that I may or may not be related to who are the Mandans, they were actually nations with kings and kingdoms, okay? Different topic for another time, at least in terms of the more archaeological stuff. But suffice it to say for here, yeah, you had basically sovereign nations being, you know, invaded by a bunch of Europeans and all of that. So, you know, that's a part of my family history, too. Uh, yeah, so, 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 so pretty much uh, I'm trying to extrapolate this out to, to even, you know, uh, uninhabited ocean islands now. Uh, yeah. You consider, uh, you know, how much I don't remember what the oh I should remember this from uh, from geography class uh, back in uh, in government schools, but I don't remember uh, uh, is it like uh, Pangaea or, or uh, what's the where, where all of the continents were together um, yeah. to start with. So so even so even if you um, so even if you uh, like look at some of these uninhabited uh, these supposedly uninhabited you know unowned ocean islands, um, mm -hmm. if you know government hasn't been able to lay like, claim to them yet, even though it's you know unjust to begin with. Uh, mm -hmm. even some, even those, you know, they, they like that, you know, the water may have shifted, you know, there might've mm -hmm. actually been, you know, widespread of land there. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but how would you know with, but how would you know without any written records you, or some sort can't. of objective? That, that's, that's, it's, it's so obfuscated. I mean, there, ding, there's, ding, there's, ding, there's ding, no, ding. there's no way to know, uh, which, which I, I think is, is kind of the, kind of the problem here. Uh, yeah, that's so, so, no so I, I remember, I remember a moment ago, you, um, and, and maybe, maybe you've answered this, but I just want to get this, get this clear, at least for my benefit, if not the listeners sure. too. 
But you, you said you'll you at least half agree with Ray on this. What's the part that you disagree with him on? Is that kind of what you're explaining just now? The the question really revolves around the cutoff point. Where do you cut it off at? Do you do you cut it off at a certain century? Do you cut it off from like let's okay if 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 the standard for property acquisition and titling is just what you can prove in a court of law, even if it was not a government thing, but like some sort of like DRO anarcho capitalist type thing. I mean I don't care about the context, some sort of judicial function, okay? Uh, even if it's private arbitration. Um, if the cutoff point is just what you could prove, like on paper, like records, like land ownership, and you just go to the oldest recorded owner and that's the cutoff point, then that guy, whoever that is, that entity, is the first user because that's what's provable. But of course, here's the other problem. There are those other folks who uh, whose ancestry, they have like an oral tradition. Um, I definitely know the, the Sioux, definitely do. The Algonquin Sioux, so they have an oral tradition, so is that acceptable evidence? Depends whom you talk to. Some of those people feel very strongly about their oral tradition. They were, at least at one point in their history, willing to kill over it. So please see the uh, American, um, like, Sioux, like, Indian, so-called Indian wars that lasted over a century. Uh, that was actually during the first part of this country's history, actually, were those so-called Indian Wars. Um, and that was part of it because it was all over, well, whether, you know, well over land in a lot of ways. Um, at least that was part of it. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's kind of rather interesting. So where's the cutoff point? And this is what the listeners should really ask themselves. Do you cut it off with, you know, recorded like land title deeds? And that's the other thing, too. Like, and, and this is to some degree where I will concede a little bit to the syndicalists in terms of, uh, what 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 is an acceptable record? And related to that is what is the acceptable legal system that will enforce uh, or or otherwise justify the authenticity of those of those land titles? Because if you abolish a government, that may be all well and good, at least at least from an ethical perspective. But then in terms of practicality, um, how are you going to start over? Yeah, how, how do you go, how do you go about uh, distributing the land and and how it's it's and this is no, kind of, no, this worse. is this is kind no, of a it, problem for proprietarian anarchists, isn't it? I mean, I mean, no. so so as far as as far as as far as me. as far as property, like yeah, like com computers and things, like the mobile things, as we talked about in that fee simple versus lodial title, um, you know, things that are mobile, you like uh, uh, at least legally, like you could have some secured property rights, sure, mm -hmm. but when it comes to land, which is what we're talking about tonight. Um, Everything goes out the window. The, is, no this is yeah, this is a problem for proprietary anarchists, and, and 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 I don't know. I mean, maybe this is, uh, and, and I'm just I'm thinking out loud here. And obviously, I am a proprietary anarchist, uh, so you know, so, so don't claim what I'm saying is like a some cynicalist thing. I'm just kind of thinking here. Um, so, uh, hell, I don't know, man. This is this is this is a problem. <laughs> may, may, I, may I suggest something? I I don't remember the fellow's last name, but he was a uh, libertarian Ukrainian, first name Roman. He's actually been known in, in like Ron Paul type political crusading circles, at least to some degree. He said something very interesting, and I did quote him at one. I did write it down because I thought it was interesting, um, and I put it up on the blog. I'll, I'll paraphrase it here since I don't have it in front of me. He said something very interesting at one point where he basically said that libertarianism really needs to get back to its warrior aristocrat aristocratic uh, roots, where essentially. My family guards this wall, your family guards that wall, and inside we have a market with property rights. If people accept our cultural norms, we'll invite them in, but if they're hostile and want to take over and murder us, we'll kill them first. And that's grown-up libertarianism is essentially uh, using force to defend property rights. But then, of course, there's the, the conundrum. How, you know, who owns the land inside the libertarian castle, in other words? And yeah, and and sure, like that, like it would it would more so be uh, you know libertarians love ethics, and you know I, anarchists do too. I, I you know I I enjoy ethics to some extent. I'm sure you do as well. Uh, Better than laws. Well, yeah, for sure, for sure. So 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 even even you know uh, you know the United States government's abolished, and you know this this continent uh, is now you know uh, I, I guess I, I don't know if if it would just be like okay, well first user, I mean they they get it, or I, I don't know how that would how that would come about. But uh, then it would still come down to how, however the hell it's however the hell it's you know decided, or however it spontaneously comes about. Uh, there's still that kind of uh, ethical issue there too. Like this is uh, this is you know unjustly acquired property, right? Uh, it was not uh, you know from from the first user passed down. 
Uh, yeah, there's no restitution know, to, to, to them. There's no restitution to that first victim. And then plus, uh, I mean, everything's further obfuscated by the by the by the uh, you know by you know gov like the United States government too. So like it's it's this is this is quite an issue. And uh, this is the right, only thing. So so right, so real quick. So so Rayo mm -hmm. not only you know introduced all of these fantastic solutions, but he also he was very you know um, non dogmatic. I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, he was it was very very much kind of autodidactic trying to figure out what the hell is going on in the world and what's the best way to become more invulnerable to coercion increase your personal freedom etc so not mm -hmm. only did he did he you know come up with these kind of solutions and he, he kind of tried them out and lived them but he's also bringing up some very very good points that uh you know you uh, i mean hell i never heard any libertarians or anarch anarchists talk about fee symbol versus lodial title uh and it's, it's it's kind of like proper private property is taken as a given uh for for a lot of folks and, yeah yeah i uh, shouldn't do that yeah so so yeah so rayo presented <laughs> like not only not only you know practical but also philosophical too was, was kind of what rayo presented but yeah go ahead well i would just say this okay so let, let's say the ancaps got everything they wanted and the minarchists can just shut their yaps about uh you know their hypothetically limited government which didn't stay limited they shut their yaps because like the rest of us were like actually correct about things like human action and whatever else and let's say the state is abolished, okay, rah, 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 we, we've won, quote unquote, okay? Then the important thing is what comes next. Yeah, and yes, I would even agree with some of the Austro-Libertarians that probably what would happen in terms of like the land uh, titling, which is what the issue really here is, the land titling is that, yeah, it, it would, uh, as with everything else, since government's now abolished, it would be privatized. So there would be different companies uh, businesses that would compete for market share in the sense of providing a product of actually like issuing the land titles. And they would have to have surveyors. Uh, they would have to accurately measure the map and they would have to have topographic maps. Um, expropriated from the uh, United States Geological Survey, former, because the federal government's now abolished, keep that in mind. Or they would actually probably improve on it, make their own like privatized uh, topographical maps, which would actually be better, and you know measure everything from this latitude of longitude to that latitude of longitude, the actual real land, not political borders, because remember there's no government anymore, and uh, it would basically be privatized. There'd be competition, and some of them would get it right, some of them would get it wrong, but basically, you know, given whatever amount of time it needs for everything to sort itself out. Uh, there would be, um, you know, there uh, a lot of people would probably still keep their land especially if they've had it for a long time. Um, for other people where they may be newer, maybe some lines get redrawn, maybe not. Uh, compromises could be negotiated, especially over things like streams, because water is very important, uh, especially if you're uh, pretty inland as opposed to coastal. Um, and then with all other land that's really hotly debated, um, it, you know what? I'm going to be really cynical here, Shane. I would not be surprised if post-government, and I'm saying like right, right after, you know, I'm saying like idyllic situation, okay? If post-government, like when people are like fresh into it, uh, if there's going to be some violence over it, and then whoever wins, wins, and well, you know, it's kind of like may the best man and, win kind of thing. And the unjustly acquired property line continues. Or at the very least, or at the very least, it's um, it, it would be considered a no man's land. Yeah, uh, a, gray, following... a gray area disputed. Yeah, yes, yeah. And they would, and and because they would not, and and I'm not saying this would be widespread. It, it could be, it could not be. I don't know. I mean, this is getting awfully speculative, but it's not completely a priori. It's not completely unreasonable to, to assume that in certain areas that are that have always been hotly contested, especially uh, the so-called public lands, of course, that uh, it wouldn't result to violence even after the government's abolished between certain private parties that were successful or just sitting on the sidelines while the government was being abolished. And then they would kind of poke their heads up, maybe kill a couple people, maybe uh, bust some teeth in, depending on their uh, level of uh, violence and what they're comfortable with. And um, and then depending how all that goes, may the best man win. And then that's the first user from that point on that's recorded in the title deeds. And then everything from that point forward is is in accordance with libertarian ethics. So that's something else to kind of consider too. And 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 to go back to Roman for a second, you know, interesting using force to defend property rights. Well, that's kind of interesting too. So it's like the only real land you can actually have is that which you can defend. True. Yeah. Yeah. So if you talk about invulnerability to coercion, I, I remember the Vanu book, Rayo mentioned something about like there's deterrence and mobility and concealment and deception. Well, there was also defense. Now, he did take more of a of a poo pooed uh, attitude towards defense, basically that with the invention of basically uh, siege warfare, the you know trebuchets and then, of course, uh, nuclear weapons. 
that uh, defense is is kind of silly, uh, except in some circumstances. Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, you 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 pit a man with fists against a man with a pistol, you know, uh, unless the other guy is as very adept and can surprise the guy with a pistol. I think the guy with the pistol is going to win most of the time. Yeah, yeah, bring bringing fists to a gunfighter. Yeah, you know the the saying. Yeah, no, I I know what you mean. I know what you yeah, mean. So I, so I, so it, it, so it comes down to. As far as you know, purely ethical, you know, purely, you know, um, there, there's there's obviously no clear record of the first user anywhere on this continent, as far as I'm no. concerned. There's no way to no. prove it or disprove it, or regardless. No. So what it, so what it comes down to is there's got to be a time whenever you know, say the government's abolishing from that time on, you know, 2075. Um, then it just kind of reverts back. Okay, we don't know who actually owned this first. It's a ban. It's it's unclaimed. It's a, it's a, call it abandoned. Call it unclaimed. It's just a no man's land. And now it's um. You know, actually, there is a term. John Locke called it in vacuous locus. Basically, it's it's vacant in English. Okay, so now it's vacant. It's like okay, whoever you know, it's you know, first past the post. Yeah, <laughs> to borrow another. Uh, whoever, whoever, uh, whoever's got the fastest car. Uh, well, it's theirs, yeah. <laughs> you know, get get there. Uh, but but then, of course, remember to go back a paragraph or so in the Ethical Lane News article. Remember what Rayo said: what counts as actually homesteading it? Does picking the berries counts? So so there's actually okay. So so maybe to kind of simplify this. Sorry sorry, folks. We're kind of reasoning this out as we kind of go along. So maybe there's two things going on here at least. One is where's the cutoff? In terms of, okay, at this point in time, whatever that is, whether it's a recorded title deed or whether it's ab abolition of government or whatever the cutoff is, the cutoff is X, okay? That's the cutoff. Everything that happens before, we're just going to whitewash it quite literally. And it's abandoned property or unclaimed property as of the cutoff. Then from that point forward, it's like, okay, now how do we determine first user, first owner? What is, this is the second consideration after the cutoff. Second consideration is what is the threshold of ownership? You know, you could also be a transient across unclaimed or abandoned property, you know, real wilderness, real wilderness. You could just be a transient going from point A to point B or just wandering aimlessly. Doesn't and you pick a couple berries. Doesn't mean you homesteaded it. I will agree with Rayo about that. So think about those two considerations. What's one, what is the cutoff? And two, what's the threshold of ownership? And I think all Ray was pointing is is really saying here, Shane, is he's just pointing these out and kind of you know giving explaining his concerns. Right, right. And we haven't even gotten to the other his uh, the other three, uh, I guess, uh, uh, proposals, or I guess kind of the the three most uh, common, do or I guess the th three other common doctrines that are that are kind of uh, typically uh, presented. So I guess uh, we we need to move forward for for the sake of time, but. Uh, I, I think the list, listeners can, can can definitely understand that uh, you know Rayo raised some some real concern like I guess some some real concerns here. Uh, this isn't this isn't your normalist uh, you know socialist communist rhetoric. Uh, possessions not property or anything like that. He's just saying, hey, what the hell's going on here? I'm trying to figure this out, and this, this seems pretty arbitrary to me. I mean, how do you figure this out? And uh, you know, uh, Kyle and I just tried to do that in about a half an hour and uh, or throw 25 minutes or so and. And uh, yeah, I don't think if we spent you know uh, uh, two more hours on this, we, we'd come to a clear answer. Uh, so <laughs> I think uh, do you have anything else on that, or are you ready to uh, you know get on to the the, the much easier uh, explanations here? Okay, my my own just just individual preference uh, in terms of like answering my own questions or whatever is that I think the cutoff should be basically government abolition, and that in terms of uh, the threshold of ownership, I would pretty much say. Like when you actually start building structures, like whether e I would say even a, a cabin or a shack would probably count. But so, so you're proving that you're basically being stationary. You're not just being mobile like a transient. But, you know, but again, that that that's that's kind of like a more preferential thing on my part. I don't know if that's I mean, that may or may not be objectively or even a priori vi viable. I mean, uh, other people would need to kind of uh, put their two cents in on that. But I would think we let's abolish government first. And then people start building shacks, and then maybe we can have an empirical demonstration of first owner, first uh, uh, first user, first owner. Yeah, I would, I would, yeah, I would tend to agree with that. Yeah, I think that's that's, I think that's, uh, you know, some some fair answers to those questions. So, all right, we can okay, take a breath, guys, take a breath. Now on to some easier ones. Whoo, we made it. All right, a second doctor, uh, quote, a second doctrine asserts that land belongs to the first person able to use it intensively i.e. cover it with improvements. By this doctrine, a farmer has the right to seize land from a tribe of foragers. 
But this doctrine is, an, is as arbitrary as the first and raises such questions as what constitutes an intense use? May a government seize, condemn the, farmer field, the farmer's fields to build an airport? This doctrine is most applicable to built-up areas, houses, and factories where the improvements, artifacts, may be more valuable than the land. It isn't relevant to wilderness land, end quote. So, uh, kind of the same question that you, you just you just tried to answer. Uh, I mean, what's, you, using, what's used intensively? Is it building a shack? Is it, uh, you know, building a, uh, an automotive, uh, you know, assembly line factory? Is it, uh, <clears throat> is it uh, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, parking your van there for um, a, a year and starting a garden? I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's I, th I think he raises an interesting point here. Okay, so maybe let's do this backwards. So when he asked the question about may a government seize or condemn the farmer's fields to build an airport, obviously if, if the government's been abolished, then that's kind of a nonsensical question. Right, right. right. Okay, so maybe a, maybe a little bit better way of putting it is let, let's assume post-government. May a gang, a uh, private gang, an organized criminal syndicate, or maybe an unorganized criminal syndicate, you never know. I mean, criminals will still be around after government, right? So may a criminal Caesar condemn the farmer's fields to build an airport? I'm just going to go ahead and say no. <laughs> well, no, ob ob obviously not. Obviously not. No. Okay. No. Okay. Okay. Look, so that one should be easy. Okay. Now let's go a little bit backwards. So here's the more interesting one. He says, by this doctrine of farmers, the right to seize land from a tri tribe of foragers. I think maybe perhaps that's poor phrasing. Um, okay. So let's assume... Let's let's go by what I said a minute ago. Let's assume the cutoff is government abolition. Let's assume this all goes over the hitch, so the and caps get everything they want, more more or less. Okay, fine, whatever. Um, now it's invacuous locus. Now it's you know whoever gets there first and whatever. Okay, so let's assume you have a guy who basically he wants to do off grid homesteading, and there's already a, uh, a what was that other article? The one on Schmoomans, I think it was. Were they the Schmoomans, the super hobos? Sh yeah, Schmoomans. Super hobos. S M U M A N S. Okay, well, okay, let me let me let me make this hypothetical. This is perfect then. Let's assume there's a bunch of schmoomans that are on a 20 acre lot, let's say. And they've been there for or let's say traveling around the area, but have frequented that 20 acre lot over the past 5 years. And they're picking berries. But they also grow some crops too, but then they move the crops because well, they're schmoomans, right? Now let's say that after this five-year period, um, an off-grid uh, homesteader wants to basically set up a shop and 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 like have a family and kind of do all those kind of in some ways typical things and so forth. Now here's the question: If the off-grid homesteader does that and he's trying to basically cultivate pretty much the entire 20 acres, is that the same thing as seizing the land? Well, I, I think it's it, it brings up uh, so, so, he's so let's he's, say he's stationary; they're mobile. Right, so right. Where's the, so, where, so where's the coercion? I'm trying to find it. Now, I will say this. As the farmer, or the, the, the homesteader, as he's developing out to, to more and more of the 20 acres, if the Schmoomans, let's say hypothetically, started to kind of get antsy, I'm like, why is this guy developing out like all these crops? There's nothing preventing these two different parties from going to the negotiating table and trying to, to, to voluntarily and peacefully seek a solution that suits them both. That, that's 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 true, and, and Rio raises a concern later on in the article. We won't we won't cover it for the sake of time, but uh, so, so so say that uh, you know that hypothetical example does you know happen, and you know he uh, you know the off grid home setter says, hey, you know, no one's here. Well, I'll just go ahead and you know set up shop, uh, so to speak, and uh, and uh, he he's there for like let's say you know the the uh, um, the the Smoomans, the Vanuans, they they. Uh, you know, only come back there, you know, every, uh, you know, month or so to, you know, pick the berries and, and make apple pies or whatever. I don't know. Uh, not apple pies, but you, <laughs> right, they're whatever. Mi so, right, they're so, migratory. So they, they're gypsies. Yes, yes. So so, so the, the off-grid homesteader gets there, and and, and, uh, and he's been there for, for about a month or so, and the, 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 Von the Vonowins come back, and they're like, what the hell, man? Like, we've been, you know, foraging this for, like, five years now. Like, what are you doing? And uh, he's like... You weren't here when I was here. Like, there's no evidence that anyone was here. Um, so it, it could. So, so why would the off-grid homesteader? Uh, why would he even, you know, consider the idea of negotiating? If well, no one's here. Like, you, what, what are you talking about? There's no, there's no house here. I mean, it, it's just barren land. Um, there's some trees. There's some, some bushes with berries. But what, what claim do you guys have to this? Like, what, what claim do you guys have? I, I, I how, how do I know you're not? How, how do I know you're not lying to me? Just saying that you've been here. Um, so, so I, I don't know. What do you think? 
Well, again, I mean, there's also nothing preventing them from talking to each other. And, you know, and yeah, that, that first encounter or two might be a little bit awkward. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure one or two of the Shmoomans would say, hey, this is part of our tradition that, you know, we're a migratory people. This is one of the areas that we kind of revisit and all that. So, you know, there, that, there's nothing, that, that there's is, nothing preventing them. True, I'm, not, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying they're the owners necessarily. But what I'm saying is that as part of their tradition— there's nothing per which you think conservatives would be uh, would be behind, but anyway, that's a side note. There's nothing preventing the the Shmoomans from saying, "Hey, this is part of our tradition. You know, we're migratory people, gypsies, or whatever." Do you mind? And this mind, one of your do you mind if we come over here and pick berries every month or so? And the the guy like right. you know, pe pe people tend to avoid conflict when they can. That's why you know, in, in right. people's personal lives, they they, they don't uh, you know uh, extort their neighbors. They do that through mm -hmm. through the voting booth. So you know, mm -hmm. and, and I I do agree with you that uh, even it, like it, it's it's so minimal. It's such a minimal um, burden upon you know, say that off grid homesteader who appropriated that land or, or I guess homesteaded it. That uh, you know, he's like, oh. Like, you guys want to come pick berries here every month? You know, you don't do anything else. Hell, go for it. Why not? Um, so I think there are there are there are solutions to that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but as, get, getting back to to Rayo's doctrine, uh, uh, you know, land belongs to the first person able to use it intensively. Um, I, I I hadn't heard. Let me ask you this: Have you have you heard that kind of uh, you know that that second doctrine regarding you know land? Uh, I guess land ownership. Where well, I guess wouldn't that kind of be uh, kind of the eminent domain thing? I don't know. Like, well, you, well you, you've got a house here. Well, I mean, that's not intensive enough. Let's set up a shopping mall. That's pretty, that's more intensive. Yeah, but then again, what's the threshold? That that uh, I guess doctrine specifically. <sighs> yeah, but but again, what's 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 the threshold of it? What what counts as intensively? So if the threshold, like I was mentioning earlier, if the threshold is as low as just build like a shack and prove empirically that it's something stationary, that you're not a mobile gypsy type or whatever. And that you're here to stay, uh, at, le at least for now, uh, then that's sufficient. So that I mean, but that that's kind of an unknown question, right? Like, what what's the threshold here? Now, like I said earlier, my personal preference is just build the shack, prove it that that you're there, and then you know whatever, and then everything else is pretty much negotiable in terms of like what the borders are or whatever. Um, I don't think that's asking a lot because, of course, see, and see, hold on. This is actually very important to bring up. You know, I don't like what George Washington did because his actions directly contributed to the Whiskey Rebellion because he was just buying up like thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of acres in Virginia and Pennsylvania and so forth. And he was then buying up so much land that the landowners – kind of found themselves in the uncomfortable position of one day being landowners and then being Washington's tenants where they're paying rent to him for like no reason. And the worst part was that Washington was going into debt over it because of course he was anything but frugally conservative. I mean, he was a spendthrift. I mean, that, I mean, that's very important, ladies and gentlemen, George Washington, first president, father of our country or whatever, general Washington. That's, that's, that's how I think of him, by the way, as a general, like he's a soldier. He's also a bloodthirsty psycho, but that's another discussion for another time. Well, you know, I, I feel alive when my holes are being shot through my cloak. Literally, he said that in his journals. Uh, why this bloodthirsty psychopath basically becomes kind of this landowner by going into debt and charging people, uh, you know, rent on land that they had owned just a couple, just a couple weeks before. Yeah, and, and, and oh, by the way, it's, it, you know, I mean, there's also such a thing as strong-arming people, too. I mean, keep in mind, too, I mean, Washington was a government stooge before he became a different government stooge for a different government, too. I mean, this guy was not exactly, except for being a surveyor for a portion of his life, and even a lot of that was under government contract, by the way, uh, not necessarily British East India Company, but, uh, or whatever, but, uh, you know, I mean, the British Empire was not going. You know, they they had to contract out the surveying of of the lands they wanted to conquer, right? So there's that angle too. Um, but but yeah, I mean, it's it's just like, sorry, I don't mean to go on, dude. It's just kind of like <sighs> there's these unanswered questions. Rayo is trying to pose the questions and try to at least try to figure out a way of how to even approach getting an answer. So again, what's the cutoff and what's the threshold? And yeah. and. And he, he's posing it. He's asking questions. And, and he, oh, here's one other thing, too. In some ways, he's actually reminding me of F.A. Hayek here, where he's, he's kind of – it's more of an exploratory way. Like he doesn't have a set answer, but maybe he'll find one, maybe. 
but yeah, in terms of like built up areas and all that, yes. I mean, given the fee simple system, the government's power of eminent domain is is kind of a is kind of like after the fact, right? Because they hold the land in a lodial title. Because you only own the land in fee simple, therefore, uh, if they want to seize the land for uh, some sort of corporate shill, you know, special interest type to build a shopping mall or whatever, then they just use their allodial, uh, because it is a whole other allodial title, then they can just use their power of eminent domain to force you to sell at the alleged True. fair market value, which, of course, that is also What's philosophically... What's the fair market value? <laughs> well, actually, well, they, okay, yeah. okay, not only, well, not only that, but the, but the kind of the preliminary to that is force you to sell. What the hell does that mean? I thought selling and buying were voluntary. What does force you That's to sell true. mean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so the coercion of forcing, I mean, it's kind of like the Obamacare thing with forcing people to buy the medical insurance because it's a so-called individual mandate. So it's like, oh, we're going to force you to buy a product. See, that's the thing. Obamacare is a, the individual mandate is actually very similar to eminent domain in a manner of speaking. So the one is where they force you to buy something, and the other one they force you to sell something. But buying and selling or trading is yeah. voluntary. So how the hell does that work in bizarro land of the state? Well, it doesn't. Therefore, the world is in conflict. Well, no kidding. Right, right. All right, so we've got uh, we got two two first doctrines out of the way. Uh, now these last two will be extremely easy to get through, uh, extremely easy to debunk. Uh, <laughs> a third uh, quote: A third doctrine of land ownership asserts that since no individual created land, land is owned by society as a whole or all the people. But this merely compounds the absurdity. If no person created land, how 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 did all people do so? In practice, since little, if anything, is done with the unanimous consent of all people, some ruling group attempts to control land in the name of the people. This le oh, actually, hope oh, we'll end quote there. The next one leads into the fourth doctrine. So, uh, that's just you know public lands all over again, right? I mean, what is uh, you know, what's uh, <laughs> the most absurd one? Yeah. So, so public, so public property is owned by everybody at once, and it's owned by nobody. And uh, you know, you own it. I mean, you you have a stake in owning it, but you have no you have no say in what goes on there. Uh, you have uh, no you have no saying whatsoever, but you own it. Trust me, you own it. it makes a whole lot, of, whole hell of a lot of sense, right? Yeah. Hey, Shane, I I, I guess we should go grandstand at Malaher then, right? Oh no. Oh, oh maybe it was because it was a birdcage. <laughs> maybe we should find some other piece of public property because we do own that, right? Well, actually, yeah, that's that's a good point. Yeah. So so the folks there <laughs> did own that property, right? You know, by you know using the using the uh, the the illogic logic of uh, public lands. But most uh, of them but, weren't uh, even from Oregon. That was the no, best part. No, but it, you know, it's it was BLM land, though, right? So, so they did own it. I mean, we all own it. Kyle, you own that land. How I do. do you feel about that, yeah. Wait, but I remember some of the locals telling the 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 C four CF guys to kind of like, "You're not even from Oregon. Leave." Like, no offense. It, does, it doesn't like, matter. It's it's federal land, and therefore we all own it. But wait, we, no, that's no. It still doesn't make sense because remember, the whole point was to transfer the public ownership or the lodial title from the feds to the Oregon government. But these were guys who weren't even from Oregon. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But so, so yes, the point is that it's all controlled schizophrenia, like like up and down the line, right? Like nothing doesn't makes make sense. sense. <laughs> no, and it's not supposed to. And also, one other thing too, I think there's also quite a bit of collective movementism here. Like the like the actual collectivism is really thick on this third doctrine, isn't it? Well, it has to be. It has to be, right? And, and unfortunately, the borderarians too. It's you know we we all own this land. I mean, we've been victimized by the state, and and this is like this this is that land. So you know we, we, it's ours. It's ours. Uh, no, sorry guys. Yeah. Sorry. So wait a minute. If I go country shopping and there's another country with kind of like arguably similar problems to here, does that mean that once I naturalize there, I have a stake in the public property of that other country that I've I've expatriated to? You own that land, don't you get it? But wait a minute. It's, it's, I'm not the original. But wait, according to what's his face? <laughs> but no, wait, Shane. If I remember what's his face is arguing correctly, as a naturalized immigrant, I have no fucking say over anything because I'm an immigrant, and immigrants don't have rights apparently because they ain't even human. They're subhuman, according to him, apparently. So at that point, it's kind of like but, but, okay. One, one, once you start paying taxes, though, then you have a stake in it. Okay, so wait, but that, but well, remember he contradicted himself on that one too, because there was like, well, what about like the native-born people who like don't pay taxes? 
oh well they right. still have a stake in it because they're native because they're natively born so they're, like they're, this they're shit still, doesn't they're, make they're sense still, they're still victimized of the state but and therefore you know this uh this this land of the people is still is still there no, no 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 he kept moving the goalposts that's an actual logical fallacy so it's like okay what's what's the freaking goalpost here is it being native born versus being an immigrant whether naturalized or hop skipping jumping over the border is is that it is it being a taxpayer versus not being a taxpayer i mean what's the goalpost here and he kept moving the goalposts and i really felt sorry for Larkin Rose being his uh, being his debating opponent, it's just like, geez. I mean, I really feel sorry for Larkin. On that well, yeah, one. And, and it was well. So, so the pub, so uh, yeah, according to the public lands, you know, the, this third doctrine of land ownership, uh, you know, belong, and, you know, rightfully, you know, it's, it, it rightfully belongs to, uh, you know, those who are victimized by, you know, the uh, the United States federal government. And it was funny. I don't remember if this was brought up, but uh, okay. So what about uh, you know all the families that have been bombed and and murdered into oblivion by uh, you know yeah. the uh, by the military? Well, they have, yeah. they have a say, too. So where does it end? I mean, the United States government, you know, has victimized everybody in the world, pretty much, uh, to, yeah. to some degree, whether it's economic, you know, war, war related or uh, sanctions or otherwise. Uh, so that means, that means that everyone in the world has a stake to this so-called public land. So the uh, distinguishing so distinguishing between the native born versus an immigrant, even a naturalized one. Doesn't matter. And or and or taxpayer versus not taxpayer, whether native born or immigrant, doesn't freaking matter, even according to his own alleged standard, which apparently changes every other sentence. So no wonder Larkin Rose got red faced. Heck, I probably would have too. <laughs> I mean, he, I mean, I mean, it, it was it was a nonsensical debate, and I almost felt sorry for Larkin. I mean, it, other than why did he agree to do this? But you know, because like you, you knew you, you know, like he must have known he was walking to a hornet's nest on that one. I mean, just even the subject matter. Right. I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So, right. Whole, so I, I, th I think the listeners can can allude, like, I, I can uh, can understand what, we're, what what debate we're alluding to here. Uh, but uh, but but yeah yeah yeah. I'm not I'm not gonna post a link in the show notes or anything. There's no no more undue attention needs to be paid to to, to this, to, especially to that debate because it wasn't it wasn't a debate. It was uh, I don't know. I, I consider it like a. Um, um, there, there's, there's, there's a uh, an adult on like an, an adult supervisor on a playground, <laughs> and uh, the child is uh, the child is kicking, you know, other kids off of uh, you know certain uh, play toys because uh, he claims they're his even though they're owned by the school. So I don't, I don't know. That might be a bad example, but it was, it, it was. I think it's perfect. It I think it's per. I think it's perfect actually. <laughs> Oh, anything else there? Can we move on, please? That one, yes. that one pisses me off. Okay, yeah, so the so society, so, so society as a whole, no, it's not. Collective movementism is a lie. Next, next one. All right, so uh, this uh, quote this leads to the fourth doctrine: sovereign control of all land belongs to governments, either by divine right, in the case of absolute monarchs, or by the equally mystical will of the people. Governments then delegate plots of land to favored subjects. This is the least tenable doctrine of all. A fictitious title is, in essence, transferred to a government by an equally fictitious contract. Uh, I was stopping there for a second. Is he talking about the contra Constitution? Uh, anyways, yep. back to it. Quote, yep, yep, yep. Furthermore, since most governments on Earth are essentially monster criminal conspiracies, guilty of wholesale murder and robbery, any property such a government might otherwise claim is forfeit as restitution to its victims. Unlike other land users, a government does not even have a moral claim to structures it may put on land. Since a government has no moral right to land, no one has a moral claim by virtue of assignment by government, i.e. legal title, end quote. So, uh, actually, that kind of brought up, that was actually, uh, holy hell, that was, uh, you know, he, he made, uh, you know, uh, Larkin's opponent's argument there, didn't he? Uh, his forfeit is restitution to its victims. Unlike other land users, a government does not even have a moral claim to structures may put on the So, I guess that's not the important part, but, but yeah, governments are monster criminal conspiracies. And uh, any property such a government might otherwise claim is forfeit as restitution to its victims. So I guess in essence, that's kind of he's kind of agreeing with uh, with this uh, this gentleman, huh? Ah, uh, but 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 go back to what he said earlier. How least, would you the the least tenable doctrine of all, though? So like he he's just <clears throat> he just he's laying out the position. So he doesn't agree with that. But no, uh, he doesn't. No, he no, he doesn't agree with with the fourth doctrine at all. But he made fact, he made the argument fucking fifty years before. Uh, mm -hmm. this jackass, but yeah, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. Okay, so let, let's do the equally mystical will of the people one first, because that's easier. Obviously, the equally mystical will of the people is pretty much the same thing as the third doctrine, which, of course, is collective movementism. So let, let, can we can we just kind of put that one to the side? We already, we already dealt with that. Please. Okay, now let's go to divine right. This is actually rather interesting. So uh, there was a reason why the levelers in the 16th century and so forth advocated for a separation of church and state, at least to some degree. In the context of religious freedom, later, uh, Je Mr. Jefferson 
explained it as separation of church and state, but it's along that same line of religious toleration of, of religious freedom that's mentioned in the uh, First Amendment and so forth. Um, so that's kind of rather important. So if it actually is true that the deity, uh, assuming it is existent, uh, that the deity did not choose a particular uh, thug called a sovereign or monarch or king, queen, if uh, to be politically correct, of course, uh, <laughs> did not choose a particular human being to be the absolute master in terms of holding a lodial title over other, uh, and controlling the land, thus controlling other people's lives through the use of the land and so forth, as well as in other ways, then there is no divine right. So if there really is a separation of church and state, then what that means is divine right cannot exist politically, period. And that directly uh, also undermines the justification of um, the lodial title by the state. So that's actually right. rather important. So actually, see, see, folks, can see how I did that kind of roundabout way? Separation of church and state actually is very important, and even the limited government people used to be promoting that kind of stuff up until about five years ago when they started getting really religious. And then, of course, Trump came in right at kind of the tail end of that. Uh, different topic for another time. But yeah. Uh, part of the whole limited government thing is separation of church and state. That is the First Amendment, in part. Okay, That's actually very, very important, because otherwise you have religious wars and stuff, like what happened in England between Protestants and Catholics that lasted, oh, I don't know, a century or two, if not longer. I mean, th this stuff doesn't stop unless you make it stop. Now, regarding what, el what, now, regarding what else he said... Then yes, I mean, like ideally, once you get to the point of like uh, abolishing government and all that, then yes, the uh, and much like uh, what's his face said uh, uh, the the non debate or whatever that yes, uh, the point is that uh, the assets of the state would be forfeited as restitution to its victims. Yeah, if if we're if we're going by like principles of justice or whatever, but then the problem is like how do you determine? Who the victims are, because now we're going back to what we mentioned at the it's very beginning of this episode. It's arbitrary. There's you no can't... way to do that. It's it's it's, it's so right. obfuscated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You cannot you cannot determine who the victims are that are owed the restitution. You cannot determine first user, first owner. Period. For the reasons that have already been mentioned uh, at the beginning of this episode. So yes, if there were the easily identifiable victims, then of course it, the assets of the state would be forfeited. And even I would have to agree with you know Mr. Jackass. But that's not the case here, is it? Because we don't know who the victims are, and it is literally impossible to trace it back, even if we wanted to. No, no, it's it's not. I don't, I don't think that actually uh, that that sort of uh, maybe Larkin brought up. I don't, I don't remember. It's been a while since I watched it. And I'm sure it's not like going to waste time watching it again. But um, <laughs> but but you know how, how do you you know libertarian justice would be you know if you know, taken to its logical conclusion you, you know the first user well you know returning it to the uh, the taxpayers and those victimized by the state now uh, that's not the first user. That's still not, not uh, that's still not technically libertarian justice though, right? Right. It's not even tech. I mean, even if you wanted to kind of go really, really arbitrary and say, well, let's just say Indians in general, that would actually be more accurate. It's not really accurate for reasons Rayo said where we'd be like, well, it's not even the Indians in general. It's more like a few Indians, which actually is much more even, which is even more accurate. But again, this is like a this is like a sliding scale. It's like a spectrum of not really getting to the actual first user, first owner, but getting closer in terms of shades of gray to the first owner, first user. So it's like, no, you wouldn't be returning it to the taxpayers. You'd be returning it to the Indians, numbnuts. It's not that hard to figure yeah. out. But then, of course, there are problems even with that as already explained. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so th those are some, you know, for the for the interesting, uh, you know, those are those are Rayo's four doctrines, uh, or I guess the, the the ones not Rayo's doctrines, but the the four that he the four most common doctrines for for land ownership or land use. Uh, so I think really the the only one uh, that's you know the the only one that's he's like okay yeah he's kind of correct here what what do we do? like how do we find the first user well uh, they would have been that first doctrine uh, that's really the uh, I think that's the most important one uh, you know the the rest of them are just a little, a little nonsensical I mean just whatever you need to toss those out you know if you want to think about them further obviously do that but uh, but that first one uh, is is obviously I I would think you know the one of a major concern but. Uh, now, the, one more paragraph here, and this is, uh, this is Rayo's land use ethics. He says, quote, My land use ethics. No one created naturally occurring lands. Therefore, no one own land, owns land per se. 
Any rights pertain not to the land itself, but to specific uses of land. Therefore, morally, I may use land in any way which does not seriously interfere with other uses already being made, except as I may otherwise agree. The exception is important. It includes renting, leasing, caretaking, or being a guest. If I go on to some land at the invitation of another, I thereby recognize high right to control my use of that land. This is true regardless of what right E may have to the land, i.e. whether or not E has legal title, whether or not E dis dispossessed earlier, earlier users, or whatever. This doctrine is not without elements of arbitrariness. For example, what constitutes serious interference and an, uh, an event of a dispute who decides, but all concepts involving human action have boundary problems, end quote. So that is, uh, yeah, that's that's Rayo's, uh, you know, I guess, land use ethics. So what do, you, what do you think? Well, when he mentions about specific uses of land, he's kind of, not kind of, he is, specifically pointing out, like, the differences between, like, mineral rights versus hunting rights versus hell even something like an easement basically different uses of land and therefore any sort of so-called rights whether contractual or or otherwise um are actually now that i think about it actually all com purely contractual actually and therefore truly private uh where everything is negotiable so again, let's let's assume no government for, for 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 a moment because in some ways that actually makes life a lot simpler. Other than when we introduce the state into a situation, situation everything goes into a cluster frack really quickly, doesn't it? With all the coercion involved, right? right? Okay, so let, let's assume no government, and and so we're in vacuous locus. Uh, the land is abandoned or otherwise unclaimed. Oh well, actually, what was that book you mentioned earlier? The the one about the uninhabited ocean islands. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let, let's assume an uninhabited ocean island, but like a little bit larger. So like, I don't know, a Hawaiian island that's not been used or whatever, or some other place, doesn't matter. Okay, so now some humans show up and nobody's at war, nobody, there's not even crime. It's just people are just trying to survive and that's like the main activity is just, just survive. Survive and if you can, build and so forth and try to have a life and don't be a, you know, don't be, don't be a, you know, you know jerk and so forth as best you can. Okay. So everything, for the most part, is pretty peachy, uh, other than there's no infrastructure. Okay, so now you're starting over pretty much in vacuous locus. Okay, so what does this kind of look like? Well, obviously people are going to need, in uh, terms of survival basics, uh, people are going to need water. So people are going to need access to water. Now, somebody may live right next to a good source of water, a spring, a stream. Hell, maybe somebody might even take the time and dig a well even to, to gain access to maybe uh, some sort of um, deep-seated body of uh, actually fresh, clean drinking water. Um, but, you know, maybe depending on what uh, the layout, the geographic, physical, not, not political borders, but real layout of the land is, um, it very well may be the case, Shane, that uh, contractually some people may be allowed an easement to gain access to that water and... Um, you know, in return, maybe the guy gets a discount on like, you know, peaches for the rest of his life or something. So that would be contractual, right? Those would be the water rights. See what I did there? Right, right. Yeah. So that yeah. would be water rights. Like, oh, yeah, we have we have access to this water because we need to survive and it's the only water around. Okay. Or he just tells them, build a little sidewalk here and you guys can, you know, go on this edge of my property. Yeah, that would uh, that would be more of a, that would that would be more of an easement. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, again, nobody's nobody's liberty is being curtailed or violated. Uh, nobody's getting killed over this or even injured. It's just people just negotiating and trying to basically just kind of survive, right? Um, that that's one way this could turn out. Um, and let's say uh, the guy who has who owns the well, uh, at least in some sense, or at least let's put it this way, he sold the water rights. Okay, he sold the water rights. Well, let's say. He likes to move around a lot because he doesn't want to be tied to that well. He already sold the water rights. They sold the easements from Bell and Cake. He's, and he likes to move around a bit. In fact, he's a, dare shall I say, he's a little bit of a hunter. And so he goes around and, well, turns out a good chunk of the game on this island is, well, on somebody else's property that they've already uh, set up a shack on. And so it's like, hey, buddy, you want to sell me uh, the hunting rights so I can take down the quail and the elk and the deer and whatever else is there? It's like, yeah, I'll sell you the hunting rights. See, see how that works? So that use of the land for hunting, 
Well, and that, obviously, that, so that, that would that would that would be just like uh, you know on pro like private property in, in, in Colorado and in Montana and things where you know someone owns it, but you know someone comes in and say, hey, I'll pay you. Uh, you know, it's, it's obviously pretty expensive at some of these places, but, you know, I'll pay you $500 if I can hunt for you out here for the weekend. Sure, have some hunting rights. And so that kind of already happens, right? Yeah, and again, this is all contractual, all voluntary. So any ANCAPs that have any issues with this really need to, you know, wind their own little necks right back in, okay? No government is involved. This is supposed to be free market, right? Right? People do this kind of stuff, even if there were no lawyers, even if – or even if there was a legal system, it would be a private legal system. Well, it's it's actually just like uh, – so so down at our property in Southern Illinois, there's um, – we, we've cut back a little bit on this because you have four-wheelers four stolen and such. But uh, there are quite a few people who, you know, um, they, they have permission to ride over there. Uh, they have permission to use that land. Uh, I mean, and there's no there's no paperwork or anything like that. It's just kind of a verbal thing, like, oh yeah, you know, go ahead, right over here. It's fine. So oral, um, so, so oral, so oral contracts, and if it lasted for a long period of time, it would eventually become an oral tradition. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, th th this, yeah, this so yeah, this stuff already already kind of yeah, this, this stuff already happens. Yeah. Oh, you Indians, you with your oral traditions, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know, and, and then, of course, you know, as time goes on, people want to make things a little bit more formal, especially if the same type of, dare shall I say, contracts, maybe calling them rights is maybe a bad word, to, an inaccurate word to use, like water rights, hunting rights. Maybe we should call them contracts. We have a water contract. We have a hunting contract. You know, mineral rights. You know, Lavoie Finnegan was very big on uh, mineral rights. I'm like, okay, what you're oh, really yeah. talking about is contracts to mine a certain piece of land for, like, I don't know, uranium or something, right? <laughs> Um, okay, so th these are contracts. Contracts are voluntary, right? Sorry, I, I know I'm being kind of annoying about this, but I just ah, oh, this kind of really kind of irks me. So, regarding what Rayo said about any rights pertain not to land itself, but to specific uses of land, yeah, there is a lot of truth to that, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, there there definitely is. I didn't have this in there originally, but this is the last uh, paragraph from this article. Uh, he says, quote, this doctrine of land use is similar to the conventions of other life. Uh, no shit. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, back to it. Quote, many species are territorial. Bears have territories. Hummingbirds have territories. But territorial defense is directed mainly against unrelated members of the same species, i.e. individuals attempting to make similar uses. A bear does not attempt to keep hummingbirds out of its territory or vice versa. The tendency of life is to diversity, to minimize conflict, end quote. And, you know, kind of what I said earlier, I mean, it, you know, Human beings in their daily lives, you know, for the most part, we're not, you know, other than, you know, criminals, uh, you know, and even, you know, even criminals, you know, when they're not committing crimes against person and property, uh, a lot of their life is spent, you know, you know, voluntarily contracting and, you know, getting along with uh, their fellow human beings. Uh, that's just, just how it is. You know, com people tend to, you know, most people can tend to, you know, try to minimize the conflict in their life because it's a stress. I mean, why would they want another stressor? It's in their so, self, it's, it's in their direct self-interest to do so. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, yeah, so that's that. That's that's uh, you know some of the ethical land use uh, article by Rayo, and I would recommend uh, uh, you know going and checking that out. Vonnypodcast dot com. You can find it there, uh, and you can also uh, you know wait for the full publication. Uh, although well, other articles are kind of unrelated to that, but regardless, regardless, uh, uh, you'll, you can definitely look out for the full uh, publication. With uh, you know, uh, there are a lot of great articles in there, Kyle. There really are, but uh, before we get to before you know start talking about that too much, uh, I guess uh, closing thoughts on on this one. I think most importantly would be that that first doctrine that he kind of uh, you know laid out with with first use. Uh, there are a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, a lot of unanswered. Well, I guess not even really unanswered questions. It's just uh, it's uh, well yeah unanswered questions. There's no way to figure it out. Uh, I think that's probably the uh, the most significant one that he laid out, considering, you know, propertarian anarchists, uh, you know, a lot of libertarians, as long as they're not like libertarian socialists. The first use principle, you know, the Lockean notion of mixing labor with the land is uh, pretty major. It's 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 said a lot in uh, in libertarian uh, uh, pod, libertarian anarchist podcasts. So some issues there for sure, for sure. So I, I think uh, most importantly is that it, it is kind of the first use principle. Uh, really you know pragmatic or is it just kind of uh, philosophical the way things should be um i i don't know i don't i, I don't know I, I don't think it's uh we've already laid our concerns with that uh so i guess uh, what do you think kyle well 
I, I think I, I, you know, generally speaking, regarding Rayo's own land use ethics, I'll, I'll agree with him more often than not. Except I think I'll go a little bit farther because he was obviously pretty trepidatious and understandably so. I don't, I don't, I don't belittle him for that at all. It's when he said, though, therefore no one owns land per se, which obviously is a very qualified statement, um, because of course, how do you determine the land owner and so forth? And that gets into, as was mentioned earlier, property acquisition and titling. So I would just kind of suggest this. Um, you know, it's it's only really been in in recent you know year or two that I've really been kind of studying economics and so forth because I guess you know just as a political scientist, I already know government was bogus, but I didn't and I and I knew that property, wealth, capital, money were also and really issues of political economy were quite relevant to the legitimacy of, of government or as the case really is the illegitimacy of any form of government uh, and so forth. But I honestly just didn't know much about it. I knew more the political, more purely political stuff and, and legal and all that, but I didn't quite understand the economic and all that. And now having, you know, finished reading uh, Ludwig von Mises' Human Action and a couple other uh, economic treatises of one kind or another, it's, it's you know, the, the, the rights of man and his, uh, or shall I say the freedoms uh, of of man in his uh, pocketbook is actually more important than not and so forth. So when it comes to land ownership, you know, at the risk of sounding more like a black flagger rather than a propertarian, I would just kind of suggest this. <sighs> Let's abolish the state and we'll figure out property relations afterward. You know, the market will sort it out one way or another. And because it's 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 quite frankly, Shane, it's a combination of it's too early and the persistence of the state is further perverting, you know, who would be first user, first owner. And so it's making restitution literally impossible, even if you wanted to make it happen. So the best, or actually, hold on, let me wrap it with a bow on top. The best form of restitution is abolishing the government, and then we just kind of fix everything from that point forward. How about that? That's the cutoff. Yeah, yeah, I, I think, you know what, uh, <laughs> uh, philosophically, I think that's great. But, uh, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, I, there's nothing more I'd love to see in my lifetime than just see the government abolished and people, you know, understanding you know, the spontaneous order of the market. But, you know, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So well, that's why there's Vanu, but that's why there's Vanu exactly. for the time being. Yeah, exactly. So, so that's so that really so the invulnerability to coercion is the closest thing we have to restitution for right now. Yes, yes, that, um, that that is correct. That is correct. So yeah, unfortunately, uh, won't see the uh, uh, you know at least in my view, I won't see the abol the government abolish in my lifetime. I imagine I'll see a lot worse shit than just uh, you know the way things are right now. Uh, you know, there's there's probably going to be a lot more democide. There's probably going to be uh, it's going to get a lot more Orwellian. Uh, but that does not mean that uh, you know your your freedom, uh, your invulnerability to coercion uh, depends upon uh, what's happening in the state of all society. So. Uh, whether this is, you know, kind of an odd conclusion here, but, uh, you know, uh, this is for, you know, uh, Vani Podcast, um, Patreon exclusive, but this will be played on uh, Liberty Under Attack Radio since it does overlap so nicely with uh, the last time we had Kyle on there. So it's going to be kind of a joint conclusion, a joint introduction, uh, but regardless, the content there uh, is what's important. So uh, anything else, Kyle? Well, I would just kind of suggest this, you know, maybe maybe people should consider either, uh, you know, living on the water, minimalist sailboating and maybe uh, some maybe not land use ethics, but maybe uh, going on the water may help people think about property in a, in a, in a better way, just as an alternative. And uh, similarly, maybe at some point when the technologies and people are ready, uh, outer space can also be uh, interesting experimental ground in terms of uh, Land, in terms of um, ownership of what would count as land, I guess the planet surface, especially once there's some terraforming, you know, how would all that work? Uh, that's kind of really interesting too. But I think, but I think before getting into even the outer space or even living on the water, people really need to root out the collectivist spooks from their head first, and then kind of work from there. Indeed, indeed. Or as in an article that was in uh, uh, in the newest and uh, one the Vonnie Life uh, March 1973 edition rooting out the outposts uh, and I actually was not aware of this phrase but let me get up real quick so yeah this was uh, uh, this was uh, attributed to Sally Kempton uh, from Esquire quote it's hard to fight an enemy who has outposts in your head so uh, kind of right along the same lines as uh, you know uh, getting those collective spooks out of your head uh, you know if the if the enemy uh, still has uh, outposts in your head it's, it's going to be hard to, to become free and unfortunately I think a lot of the borderitarians 
who are focusing on a lot of these, uh, these I guess, these land issues uh, aren't taking account of that uh, and aren't taking account of, uh, you know, the, the whole fee simple thing. And I think it's uh, complicating, uh, and uh, I think it's, it's really complicating things uh, when they shouldn't be that complicated. But uh, anyways, thanks so much for listening, guys. Uh, Vonnepodcast.com, LibertyUnderAttack.com, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.